Well, good morning, Walden Church. My name is David. I'm the pastor here, and we are continuing our study through the book of Romans. And we are up to Romans chapter 8, and we started a little bit of that last week. We're going to pick it up here in verse 5, and of course, you can always follow along at home, but I will put it up on the screen for you. Starting at verse 5, it says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law, indeed it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. In fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. A lot going on there about you and who you are in the Spirit or in the flesh, right? Hostile to God, of the world, death, or life, righteousness. And I think that's a good discussion to have because I think there is a lot going on right now in the world today about how we identify, right? Who we are, how, how we are made up, what, what boxes we check, because there's a lot of boxes you could check. There didn't used to be that many. Now there's a lot. You know, you could, you could define yourself a thousand different ways. Are, are you Republican or Democrat? Right? That's a box. Are you a Rangers fan? <laughs> are you an Astros fan? Well, if you are, there's uh, prayer counselors in the back. Are you conservative? Are you liberal? Are you libertarian? There used to be only a couple boxes you could check for religion. Now you could check lots, right? It's not, it's not enough just to check Christian anymore. Now you could check Protestant or Catholic or Presbyterian or Methodist. Even if you were Muslim, you would click Sunni or Shia. It's not enough to be an atheist. You could also be agnostic. Or how do you use social media? Are you on Facebook or Instagram? Are you one of the people that uses TikTok? Are you Mac or are you Android? Are you introvert or are you an extrovert? Remember when the chart was only male or female? Times have changed. And with all these different ways of describing ourselves, is it any wonder why there is so much confusion now about who we are? Who are you? And how are you supposed to live? How are you supposed to live with each other? How are we all supposed to get along? That's a good thing to talk about today on a Sunday morning, because I think how we see ourselves also affects how we see our faith, also affects how we see the world. Paul says, you're a child of God. You want to know who you are? First and foremost, you are a child of God. Continuing on, he says, so then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. On the very first day of kindergarten, the teacher asked the kids in her class, to talk about their parents, to describe their parents to one another. And the kids always, you know, they talked about what their, ki what their parents did for a living or maybe how they spent their summer vacation or maybe some little embarrassing quirk about their parents. And one little girl stood up and said, I've only known my parents for about a year and a half because I'm adopted. The teacher was a little embarrassed and she asked, well, share about that. Tell, tell the class about that. What do you... How do you feel about that? And the little girl said, everybody else in the room, their mommy grew them in their stomachs, but my mommy grew me in her heart. That's a beautiful way to describe 
the fact that you are a son or daughter of God. John 1, verse 12 says, To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You see, in the kingdom of God, there are no orphans and there are no stepchildren because through Jesus, we are all children of God. And that's amazing. It is. Listen to how John uh, puts it in 1 John. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Don't you think that's amazing? I do. That the creator of the universe has adopted us. J.I. Packer said, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as the Father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. Of course, the most natural way to have a family is for a man and a woman to give birth to a child. But there is a second way to have a family, and that's through adoption. Adoption is the action by which the parents decide to take a child that is not their own to be their family. Adoption is a very special way to enter a home because the parents make a great effort to have that child. They choose to have that child. They are deliberate. And that process is painful and costly and time-consuming. There's a great deal of waiting and countless interviews. Sometimes they lead to a dead end and you have to start over until finally a child is found. And then they are told the child is available. And then the parents get to decide, yes, I want that child, or no, we don't want that child. It only takes nine months to have a birth child, but to adopt a child, it could take years. And once the child is adopted, that child then has the same rights and privileges of any other child in the family. Nobody can say that that child is any less a member of the family, any less a full child of their parents. In the Bible, we see adoption. The very first adoption we see is Moses, right? Pharaoh orders all the Hebrew male children to be killed, and Moses' mother, in fear for his life, places him in a basket and sets him down in the river amongst some reeds. And Pharaoh's daughter, she's bathing in the river, and she sees the basket, and she tells her handmaidens to retrieve it. She takes Moses into the palace, and she adopts Moses as her own child. We see it also in the story of Esther. Esther's parents died. She's adopted by her very older cousin, Mordecai, who loves her just like a father, and he takes care of her. But there's another story that I think is so touching and I think perfectly reflects how uh, God adopts us as children, and that's the story of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth is the crippled son of Jonathan. And when David learns about Mephibosheth, he gives all the land that had belonged to his grandfather Saul and had him eat regularly at the king's table in the palace in Jerusalem. Pharaoh's daughter adopts Moses because of pity. Uh, Mordecai, yes, loved Esther, but he adopts her because it's duty, it's family. David takes the initiative in seeking out Mephibosheth and he brings him into the palace He didn't have to. He wasn't obligated to. He wanted to. to. Mephibosheth is crippled in both feet. He's helpless. He cannot help himself. He cannot save himself. He cannot serve David in any way. But David finds an outcast, brings them into his home, and graciously gives him a magnificent inheritance. 2 Corinthians 6 says, I welcome you and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. You know what else? In Roman culture, you know, our, our author Paul is writing a book to Romans. An adopted child, especially an adopted son, sometimes has even greater rights and more privileges than the natural child. So maybe a confusing thing right now in our talk might be, doesn't Jesus talk about being born again? And now Paul's talking about adoption. 
And those two don't seem like the same thing. So which is it? Well, they're both true. They are. We are born again. We are born into God's family, but we're also regarded as adopted. Both of these statements are true because they're intended to emphasize two different aspects of our relationship with God. Being born into the family of God shows the significance behind baptism. You know, how we come up out of the water, a brand new person, and now we are an heir in Christ's kingdom. But adoption emphasizes the fact that God looked for us. He saw us helpless. He found us. He picked us and said, I want you to be a part of this family. So both statements are true. Listen to how Paul says it in the book of Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Did you catch that? Yeah. Because we are his children, God gave us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly world. That means because you are his child, God loves you, God protects you, God provides for you, God plans for you, God hears you, God claims you as his own, just as much as he might correct you or punish you, God honors you and loves you. And because you are his child, there's one more thing. We are his child and we are heirs. We are his heirs with Christ. Romans 8 verse 16 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we might also be glorified with him. So in Jewish tradition, you know, when we read some of these Bible stories, you might recall the eldest son, right? The firstborn son receives a double portion of his father's inheritance. You might remember that even from Jacob and Esau or the parable that Jesus tells of the prodigal son. But in Roman society, right, we're talking about our, our audience right now, all the children receive an equal share. They share equally in the inheritance. This is where you're thinking about, have I finalized our will yet? <laughs> Do I have a will? The reason why none of us are too too much in a hurry to write out our will is because uh, that makes us think about death. And even though it's probably good to be prepared, right, we don't like being reminded of our own mortality. But a will is not for the dead. It's for the living. That's probably why we procrastinate making our will. We like to think about other people's wills, because, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm in that will. We don't like to think our, about our own will. I don't know how many wills you've ever been in, been named in, if any, but I think if you were to get the word that, you know, some distant, unknown uncle died, and you were named in the will, you know, and, and you heard through the grapevine that that uncle was wealthy, maybe, maybe really wealthy, you would probably get on a plane and go to hear the reading of the will. Of course you would, because you'd want to know what was left to you as an inheritance. Well, as you read the word of God, you come to understand that you have been named in God's inheritance. Being a child of God is more than just having your sins forgiven, more than just being saved by grace. It is also this inheritance that Paul is talking about now. Galatians says we become heirs, fellow heirs with Christ. In other words, you're in the will now. And when you realize the magnitude of that statement, being made by God through Christ, it should be impossible for you to pass that opportunity up 
to be a part of God's family as a fully adopted, fully accepted child of God. Because Paul says you share in the inheritance, the same inheritance as the Son of God, the same inheritance as Jesus Christ. You are not only a child, but you are an heir. He says a joint heir, equal, he says. Think about a, like a joint checking account, right? If you and another person have a joint checking account, how much money are you able to write a check for? Just half? Because only, the half, only a half is yours? No. If you have a joint checking account, you can draw out 100% of what is in there, right? So if you are a joint heir with Christ, you share in his kingdom, not just a part, you share it all. You have all access to all promises, to all blessings, to all inheritance, to all glory. You are joint heirs. It is all ours. Everything we need for life and righteousness is ours. You realize how wonderful that is. I mean, to be told that you are loved, that's a good thing, right? We, we like that. To be told that you're loved is, is, is one thing, but to be adopted and made a joint heir as the Son of God, heir is in full, not just on paper, not just for an appearance sake, not just for a token, but heirs that share in the full inheritance, heirs with all the rights, all the privileges, all the promises, and that inheritance is ours for the taking. It's offered to us. It's not forced, but we have to choose it. We have to claim it. Because the flip side is also true. We could, we could pass it by. We could decline God's offer. We could refuse that inheritance. The choice is ours. Those of us who are children of God and heirs to that great promise, we have a great responsibility and a great burden to share this good news with the lost, with the outcast, with people who are alone, who do not have a family, we have found a place of belonging. We have found a family. We have found an intimate relationship with the one who accepts us, no matter what our history is or our sins or what we've done. We are called a child of God. Listen, there is no greater, more definitive definition of who you are. or what box to check. We are a child of God. First, listen to this promise in the book of Revelation. John's on the island of Patmos. He's uh, alone, imprisoned, and he hears a voice. It says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There will be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. We get to share in his glory. As children of God, as heirs with Christ, we get to share in his glory. The end of verse 17 says, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. There is an incredible, life-changing fact right here that I want you to wrap your brain around and think about as we go today. If you are truly able to believe and live this one fact out, I guarantee it'll completely change the rest of your life. And this, is, and this is it. The same power 
that reached down from heaven into the tomb and raised Jesus from the dead is your inheritance. And it's available to you right now. That's what Paul said. In other words, no matter how you've lived your life up to this point, if you can allow that old self to die, to let go of everything that's holding you back, that same power will now reach inside of the grave that is your heart and bring it back to life. I want to close with a poem, which is actually just scripture, all put together as a love letter from God to you, his child. My child, you may not know me, but I know everything about you. I know when you sit down and when you rise up. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered. For you were made in my image. In me you live and move and have your being. For you are my offspring. I knew you even before you were conceived. You are not a mistake, for all your days are written in my book. And it is my desire to lavish my love on you, simply because you are my child and I am your father. I offer you more than your earthly father ever would, for I am the perfect father, because I love you with an everlasting love. My thoughts toward you are countless as the sand on the seashore, and I rejoice over you with singing, for you are my treasured possession. And one day I will wipe away every tear from your eyes, and I will take away all the pain that you have suffered. For in Jesus, my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to show you that I am for you, not against you. And if you receive him, you receive me. And nothing will ever separate you from my love again. I have always been father and will always be father. Will you be my child? If that sounds like the life that you've always wanted, then I would invite you right now to bow your head and pray this prayer. Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus so that I could be your child. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being with me all my life, even when I didn't know it. I realize I need a savior to set me free from sin and from myself and from all the habits and hurts and hangups that mess up my life. I ask you now to forgive me of my sins. I want to repent and live the way that you created me to live. Be the Lord of my life and save me with grace. I want to learn to love you and trust you and become everything that you made me to be. Thank you for creating me and choosing me to be a part of your family. Amen. Hey, we want to thank you for coming out and worshiping with us this morning. Uh, it's been wonderful going through the book of Romans with you, but of course, we would love to have you here with us. We have two services every Sunday. Our first service is at 9.30. It's a more traditional service. We have a choir. We're going to sing hymns. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. We're going to do responsive readings. We're going to have communion. It's going to feel like the church that you grew up in. Our next service is at 11, and it is more casual, more contemporary. We have a worship team. Come casual. Come as you feel comfortable. We also have a full program during that hour from birth all the way through high school. We would love to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.